that you'll come back to see us again. Hope that uh, you've been made to feel welcome already this morning. If you're joining us by way of live stream, welcome. Welcome into our family this morning at Van Buren First Assembly. Thank you for this wonderful choir to lead us, leading us this morning in worship. We appreciate, we appreciate all of their hard work, all, all of the folks that it takes to make, make each service uh, work. I just want to say thank you. Just a few commercials. As you're turning to Deuteronomy chapter 19, I'll be there in just a second. And I uh, just want to um, remind you, it was said on the videos there before, but I just want to remind you, this coming Wednesday night, we will start back with all of our discipleship groups, all of our small groups that meet, and we will be adding some more uh, in the not-too-distant future to those on Wednesday night. So please make yourself available. On, on Wednesday night. There is something on the property for everybody. You saw a class, it, that's the class that Miss Renee and the ladies group is gonna start. It was called Ladies with Swords. Who? Girls with Swords? Good Lord. All the men better get to a class. That's all I can tell you. If they're coming home with swords, you better get somewhere and learn something because she's coming to get you. And so you better be ready to defend yourself. And uh, so we have a men's class that will meet. There's a, there's a traditional service here in the sanctuary. There's something for the kids and the youth. On, on uh, Wednesday night, Brother Glenn Dorsey will be here. Many of you know Brother Dorsey. He's been here several times. He's been a mentor of mine for almost 20 years now. And he wrote a book called Father Me. And uh, this, this is for any aged man, young man, uh, all the way up to, to a dad, a grandpa, whatever, for all the men. This is for you on how to be a better man of God in any way. And, uh, and so I, I want you guys to make sure, I understand you got a lot of time when you get home from work, you can still mow your yard, but do that on Thursday and not on Wednesday. Come to church and uh, come be a part of this class. Uh, our goal is to fill the room and, and, and to hear Brother Dorsey. He has committed to come. Uh, he lives in BB, and uh, he is committed to be here. That's a good catch, wasn't it? He's been here for the past. He's going to commit to be here for the next month of Wednesday nights, driving back and forth. You know where BB is? That's six hours, a trip that he's going to be making back and forth and come uh, to come and, co and teach our men on Wednesday night. This is going to be good. If you're a guy in the church and you don't have this book, raise your hand. Here, Don, come get it. You can have this one. And I just want to make sure if you don't have one of them, uh, they, there are several, I believe, still out at the, um, at the uh, information center. We were selling those because it cost us, but uh, we want to give them away. I don't want to let anything keep you from being able to read and be a part of this book. So if you're a guy and you don't have one of those books, uh, you can stop by the Welcome Center and they will make sure to give you one. And we want you to come and be a part. Uh, of Wednesday night. I just want to say thank you to a few different groups of people real quick before we start uh, this morning. I want to say thank you to the folks that have volunteered this past week in our after school program. Uh, it was a great success this week. I think to this point right now we have 25 kids that are, that are registered that are coming and more that are calling and more that will come to be a part of it. And so I just want to say thank you to the volunteers that show up to drive vans to go pick them up. And, and, and just thank you for making a success. I believe that, um, that uh, it will be full, that that group is going to be full as, the, as, um, as we move forward on through the school year. Um, over the past couple of days, actually I left uh, Friday uh, morning, and uh, I asked you last week that you would support. Uh, we have about 11 students, and there are more, but some could not go uh, this particular weekend. But uh, I left Friday morning, and then the students and Pastor Cody came uh, Friday afternoon, and we have been in Hot Springs at our church camp there, uh, the Assembly of God church camp, where they're taking the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They're still there now. They'll be home this afternoon. And just leaders from all over the state, including our, our district superintendent, Brother Larry Moore, uh, are spending time pouring into those kids that feel called into the ministry in whatever part they may feel called into. And um, I, I did not necessarily have to go, but I wanted to go because we will continue that training on with them here. And uh, I'll just tell you that I asked you last week that you would give. All, all 10 or 12 of those families can afford to pave their own way. 
uh, absolutely. But what I felt was it would be a great opportunity for folks to be able to sow into the lives of somebody very early on that feels called into the ministry. And so I know that God is going to bless you for it. And I'll just tell you that we got in excess of what was needed to pay for, for all of those students. And so thank you for believing in people that are being still God's calling into the ministry. And the excess funds we will use to purchase curriculums for us to train them and, and continue that education on for those. And I'll just tell you, I stood back Friday night and the, at the altar call and, and those kids that uh, feel called into mission and missions and evangelism and pastoring and all that went down. And I just stood there and watched and thought in amazement, man, this is absolutely incredible. So it, it was just an awesome time. And thank you for believing in our students. They'll be back this afternoon. It ends this morning. Brother Moore is preaching to them or teaching them this morning. They'll return. And then I'm going to let you hear from a few of them tonight as to what this meeting uh, has meant to them. One more thing, I'm sorry for all the commercials, is that I want to say thank you to the men's group that met yesterday, had a men's breakfast. And I, I praise God we, we, we serve in a church together that the pastor doesn't have to be at everything and that you can still do ministry without him having to be there. There were 54 men that met yesterday for a men's breakfast. Guys served and, and, and uh, had breakfast and then Pastor Gary fed them. <laughs> on the word of God for a few minutes and so I just appreciate all of those uh, wonderful church wonderful place to be look at your neighbor and say you need this you need this you need this church but you need what I'm about to tell you this morning as you can see we've reset the fence back up and uh, so you know where we're headed this morning uh, back to part three and uh, so you need this tonight if the Lord allow me uh, I, the Lord laid something on my heart a couple of days ago and I'm going to talk to you and bring your Bible tonight and uh, I'm going to talk to you about the fact that they were warned and so are we and I'm going to talk to you tonight it is a word of warning and so that may just keep some of you at home already but uh, I want to talk to you about the word of warning that was given uh, in 2 Timothy years ago and that word is still a warning for us today in fact you're living in that time right now and you need to know what that warning is and so come and be a part of that tonight Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 14 and you these are familiar to you this is where we started when we started this no trespassing series I skipped uh, here and there and so today we're going to kind of continue that on and we'll just see where the Lord takes us from here in Deuteronomy, in the, in the topic of no trespassing, the Bible said, You shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set, in your inheritance which you will inherit in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 28, the Bible said, Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. In Joshua chapter 13 all the way to chapter 21, we see that the land was divided and boundaries were marked out for each tribe or for each family. I'm not going to go back and re-preach all of this, but I said to you a few weeks ago when we started on the issue or the subject of no trespassing that down through the centuries, the boundaries of property lines have been the most controversial issues among men, causing conflict after conflict, after conflict. The, the issue of what's mine and what's yours and what is hers and what is his has always been a conflict, a controversial issue down through time and still is today. I took time a few weeks ago and if you missed the beginning of this series, you can go back and see it for yourself uh, in our archives online. But I read to you, I just simply took what the Arkansas law said about trespassing and I wrote that into a sermon. And so today I'm going to continue to add or continue to talk about that law a little further. But I said to you when we started that not all are able to read the no trespassing sign. I said to you that some of our signs were hung so long ago that now they have they have faded, they have lost their color to the point now that you cannot even tell what that sign says. It was marked years ago, you marked your property years ago, but it has been so long since you've gone back by the sign 
that now a trespasser or now the enemy can't even tell that your property has been marked. Some of us today sitting here in this room don't even have our property marked at all. So therefore, a trespasser can legally just enter into or come on to our property. You understand what I'm saying this morning. I'm talking to you about physical property, but drawing a parallel to our spiritual property that some of us today don't even have the property properly marked. And so you then are fair game to the enemy. When your property is not marked properly, and you intend to keep folks out of your property, I would say, and then the law would say, that it is then there your fault for folks that come on the property and steal, for folks that come on the property and take from your place or take what you have worked so hard for. There is no legal, there is no legal recourse for a lawyer or for the law if you do not have your property properly marked. Are you with me this morning? And so we went over that. Or we can have improper signage. You could just have a sign that says posted. These signs that you see here in front of you are what would be considered by law to be legal signs or legal markings. In other words, there is you cannot just draw you an emoji and a happy face that says posted. It has to be a sign, it has to be a sign that is approved and that can be well seen. Are you with me this morning? And so some of us have marked our property, but the enemy continues to steal, the enemy continues to take from us, and it is because you have the improper signage. And so I'll talk to you about it here in just a few moments. I said a few weeks ago that who's considered a trespasser, and we won't go back into all that. I've already preached it. But John chapter 10, verse 10 tells us that the thief or the enemy cometh not but to steal kill and destroy. You just heard Brother Richie stand here and give testimony of cancer at a very young age. And But listen, it, that is a demonic disease that does not care how old you are. I said it is a demonic disease that does not care how old you are. But you just stood here and heard him give a testimony that he had cancer on the side of his face and his throat. And what the enemy's job or what the enemy desired to do to Richie, the thief, the enemy, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy in his life. But I've got good news because the Lord finished that sentence and he said, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Yes, there is a real live devil that's out there to get you, but I'm serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today that can put that devil under his feet. Come on, somebody that can put cancer under his feet, that can put divorce under his feet, that can put death under his feet. But you got to have your property marked. Because if you don't have the property marked, there's nothing the law can do about it. And so that goes in line with obedience. If you're walking in disobedience, you can't expect the law to help you. That's a whole nother sermon. I said to you that there is a time of repayment for when the enemy is stolen from you. In Joel chapter 2, verse 25 through 26, the Bible said, the Lord says this, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. He said the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I send among you. Verse 26 says, You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. I believe there are people sitting in this room today. You are mentally wore out. You are physically wore out. You have tried to think your way through absolutely everything you can to get to a pathway of victory. But let me tell you, I just read it to you in the word of God that God has your name written on his calendar. And there is a day of victory coming. If you'll just keep marching on toward, come on. If you won't sit down in this valley, but you'll keep 
keep walking through this valley. There's victory on the other side. God, I said, has your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Psalms 139 said, all your days were written by me in my book before one of them ever came, I'm already preaching good, to be. So God knew. Look at your neighbor say, you need this. Some of you aren't dialed in yet. You need this. So God knew. Everybody believes that this is the infallible word of God? One person. You believe this is the infallible, inerrant word of God. That means that it is forever settled. There is no changing his mind. Just because you want to or don't want to does not change the word of God. Sorry. And you may say, well, that's why I'm not, that's why I don't serve him because I can't live like that. Oh yeah, he gave you the power to live the way he wants you to live. The devil just don't want you to live like that. Well, come back tonight. So Joel said, let me slow down here for a second because we're going to take off like a jet here in a minute. The Lord said in Joel, I have a day of repayment for you. For all you've been through, for all your sleepless nights, for all the stress and the worry, for all the doctor's appointments, for all the money you've spent, for all of those, I have a day of restoration for you. Come on, we're Pentecostal people this morning, are we not? So God has a day of repayment. And the enemy has got his coming. So this morning, I want to continue on and talk to you this morning about choosing the right lawyer and the right counselor. And how to get rid of the trespasser. Look at your neighbor and say, you need this. <laughs> I'm telling you, I can cont hardly contain myself. I've been preaching this to myself for about three days. You need to know about choosing the right lawyer or the right counselor. If someone has infringed upon my property, come on, I'm crossing the line, and somebody has taken my stuff or somebody is destroying what I have so, what I have so hard worked for, I don't want to see just a little pat on the hand and let you go. Come on, can I just say here for a moment, and I may, I don't know, but I'll say it. When I was, worked on the ambulance, and I saw through 10 years a number of domestic abuse and a number of abuses in the home. And one particular in, 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 in an example was several times that I was on a shift that I was working I was called to the same home about three or four different times over a period of time. And every time it was that one of the kids fell off the porch or she stumbled over the coffee table and got a black eye. And I'm telling you, over a period of time, repetitively of getting her, something isn't right here. And, and uh, he never stumbled. The kids never stumbled. And, 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 and uh, so we were called out there one time, the last time that I remember, and to a little child, to one of the kids, was about four or five years old. And when we pulled up in the ambulance, the whole side of that child's face, the eye was swollen, and the whole side of his face was black, black and blue. And when we got there, we pulled up. And as soon as we get out, here he comes. And he said he fell off the porch. I thought, today's the day. This man, did, this boy did not fall off this porch. Today, what you need is somebody to put you back in the back of that ambulance. Come on now, I'm going to step out of the office of a pastor because I'm going to offend somebody here in just a second. What you need is somebody to treat you just like you've been treating these kids and this woman. 
Come on, what the devil needs is for somebody in this church today to stand up and give him a black eye. He's been wearing you out. He has wore your family out. He has stolen from this church. He has stolen from your health. He has stolen, and somebody needs to put him in the back somewhere and pulverize. And, and I, was, I was backslid then. You think I'm bad now. I, was, I couldn't spell church at that time. And I thought today is your day. The cops pull up. <laughs> and she comes out on the porch. And I walked over to her and I said, ma'am, today's the day. You cannot put up with this any longer. The law walks up and she says, I don't want to prosecute. Let him go. The boy fell off the porch. I saw it. There's not one thing as we got in that ambulance and drove off that we can do. Because she has chosen not to prosecute, not to go after the perpetrator, not to go after the person for fear of what he'll do to her when he gets out. We drive off. That's the last time I ever saw that family. I don't remember ever going back. I don't know where they are today, but here's a question I want to ask you. When are you going to prosecute the enemy that keeps stealing from you? Come on, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. This isn't in my notes. I just feel to stay here for a second. The Bible said that you shall receive power after yet that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When is the Pentecostal church going to stand up in these last days and knock the daylights out of the devil that continues to steal from us? How do you get rid of the trespasser? I'll be there in just a minute. The landlord of the property in choosing a lawyer or choosing a counselor, the, the landowner must first ask the trespasser to leave his land. If he refuses, the landowner, now this is in some states, so go look up the law, okay? This is in some states that the landowner can remove the trespassers using no more force than is reasonably necessary. <laughs> we'll just leave that right there. Can I read it to you again? Because some of you aren't dialed in. You missed it. Look at your neighbor and say, you need this. The landowner must first... We're all landowners. Come on, let me stop here. Let me catch you up. You are all a landowner. We are all landowners. I'm taking care of my own stuff. You got to take care of your stuff. The landowner must first ask the trespasser to leave his land. If he refuses, the landowner can remove the trespasser using no more force than is reasonably necessary. However, if the trespasser enters with force and violence, then the landowner can remove them without having previously asked them to leave. If the, if the trespasser comes in with force or is violent, then I now have the right, I now have the ability to do whatever it takes to get that trespasser out of my life. It is either to drag him out in the woods, it is either to use some for, sort of, let me, some sort of force. <laughs> so you fill in the blank, whatever that sort of force is. But if he has come in with violence, listen to me this morning. I, man, I feel this. I'll get there in a minute. The enemy never means to do you any good. I said he never means to do you any good, any whatsoever. He wants you to drink as much as you can. He wants you to have as much sex as you can. He wants you to smoke as much as you can. He never intends just to tiptoe into your property. He's coming with violence. But the Bible said, that the violent will take the come on we'll take it by four today you well he never means to do you any good 
Some of you sitting here today, you're closet drinkers, closet smokers, closet whatever. Let me tell you, listen to the words of somebody that knows what they're talking about. He does not mean for you to just enjoy a beer here and there. He does not mean for you to just enjoy looking at it here and there. It is to the point that he will drive you that you can no longer live without it. I know what I'm talking about. I lived it. I did it every day of my life. I'm going to talk to you next week if the Lord allows about no trespassing. And I'm going to talk to you about the issue of alcoholism and the business of drinking. The enemy, listen young people, I understand everybody's doing it, but that's not true. I would say that to my mom, but everybody's going. And she would say, oh no, not everybody's going. She said, I'm not going, your older sister's not going, and if you stay in this house, you're not going. I'll tell you the problem today. It's not at the church house, baby. It's in the household. The problem today is not with the pastor. If he's preaching the word of God and he's telling you the truth today, the unadulterated truth of God, the problem is not the church. You don't need to find you another church. What you need is to get under the umbrella of the word of God and you need to go home and make corrections in your home. Ooh, now that I got you mad, now look at your neighbor and say, you need this. Hold on, they may slap you now. We've gone a little far. The enemy never intends to tiptoe into your property. He comes with the idea of bringing death to your life, physically and spiritually. Every time, every time, let me get where I need to be. First Timothy chapter two, verse three through six, the Bible said, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. What's the answer to peace and godliness and holiness? Prayer. Verse 3. Paul said, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, listen to what the Bible says, and one mediator. This is, here we go, you ready? We're sitting on the tarmac about to take off. For there is one God. Don't you ever let anybody tell you there's another. Mary can't help you. Allah cannot help you. Buddha cannot help you. Your boyfriend can't help you. Your girlfriend can't help you. A pastor that's out of the line of the word of God, he cannot help you. It is only through the word of Jesus Christ. It is only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way for the remission of your sin. You can't pay for it. You can't do good work for it. There is no other way but through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. For there is one God, underline in your Bible, and one mediator or one lawyer, one counselor between God and men. That man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Here we go on verse 5. Notice what it said. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. What in the world is a mediator? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. What is a mediator? Go back and read the scripture again. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, 
the man, Christ Jesus. In other words, the Bible is telling us, I, I know this is basic, but let me just get you there. There is one lawyer. There is one counselor. Who is it? The Bible told you. The man, Christ Jesus. That's the man. There is no other man. There is no other woman. There is no other law. There is no other word. The man is Christ Jesus. He is your mediator. What does mediator mean? To mediate means to settle or to reconcile differences by intervening as a peacemaker. In other words, let me read it to you again. To mediate, if I'm going to mediate between you and your spouse, then I am one who will settle. <laughs> Scary, right? I am one who will settle or reconcile your differences. I am a mediator. And I do that by intervening as a peacemaker. When I counsel couples that are arguing and fighting back and forth and they want to throw each other out and they want a divorce and they want to quit and they're going to do this and that. What I do as a mediator is I intervene as a peacemaker because I tell them in the very beginning of our counseling sessions I am not a side taker. I am here to see the see the differences on both sides. Because I'll tell you what, and I'll just use names here. I'll tell you what, Billy Sue and Bobby John, at the end of our counseling session, we're probably going to find out here that both of you have got problems on the both sides. I've come to find out that it's never a one-sided story. Come on, somebody. And in counseling, I've always found out that there comes down to problems but my job as a mediator is to intervene as a peacemaker. That's what mediate means, is to bring peace. When you, just look straight forward, when you are arguing and fussing and fighting with your spouse, the last thing you want is peace. Come on, just look straight forward. I know some of you can't answer. I, I, I know, I know. The thing you want to do is win. Come on, we are right fighters. Are y'all listening? Is this on? We're right fighters. We want to fight. We fight until one will just give up and say, okay, you're right. You're right. You win. That does not happen in my house. I know y'all. All y'all walked in your marriages this morning. Y'all got your wings on. And I see your halo. And y'all don't ever fight. I, I got you. Pray for the rest of us because we have intense fellowship in our house. There's times I'm right and she's horribly wrong. It just so happens to be about that very many times. Come on, y'all. This is funny. It's okay. The last thing you want in an argument is peace. You want to win. You want them just to, you want them just to be quiet and wave the white flag. And give in so you can win. A mediator intervenes as a peacemaker. A mediator, the scripture there said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man that man being Christ Jesus, he is the peacemaker. He is the one that will come in and settle the account. The second definition of mediator is, means to intervene between disputing parties and bring about a settlement. Acting as intervening, acting as an intervening sit, uh, person in the situation. So the scripture says that the job of God, the man Christ Jesus, is that in this trespassing, when the enemy comes to trespass on your property, he steps in as the one and only mediator to bring peace. What's going to bring peace? His word. I said, what's going to bring peace? It's the word of God. So what the Lord does is he steps into that property 
process to run the devil off because he's going to stand up. Hey, if you've got your property marked, baby, he's going to stand up for you every single time. If you properly marked your property, then this law is standing today on your behalf. But if you've not marked your property, you have no mediator. Let's just go a little further here. If you're in rebellion to the law, you have no advocate for yourself. The Bible said rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witch, rich, witchcraft, the last time I checked it out, was sin. I want you to know that we as human beings are separated by, from God by sin. And only one person in the universe is our mediator can stand between us and God and bring us back together. And I just read it to you. The person that can do that is Jesus who is both God and man. His sacrifice on the cross brought new life to you and I. And he's standing there today ready to be your advocate if you would only give him an opportunity. Come on, I, I feel like this right here. It's not on my nose, but I feel like stopping here. Just because you're here today don't mean he's your lawyer. Just because you breeze into church about once every six months don't mean that all this protection is for you. I'm going to talk about it when we move on into next week. We have so many folks today that are living the look. Well, I'll leave that there for later. Sin destroys people. Oh, Pastor, you were doing good a while ago when you were hollering and yelling and getting us all revved up. You don't have to talk about all that. Oh, yeah, that's why you're here today. Sin destroys people. That's why you see our world today on a rapid decline so fast. So fast. I, can I be honest here for a second? This probably won't sound good for a second, but just listen all the way through. These young folks that feel called to ministry and are there, and others in our church that feel called to ministry, I'll tell you what I'd almost like to tell them. If you can do anything else, go do it. If you can be a banker, go be a banker. If you can be uh, whatever, you, you go be that. Because in this, you will be misunderstood, you will be laughed at, you will be left, you will be talked about, you will be ostracized. They will... And listen to what I'm telling you. It's going to be worse for them than it ever was for any of us. Because we live in a world that does not care any more. We live in America. We don't know what suffering is. We've changed the definition of suffering. Suffering is when they didn't give me a full basket of french fries when they brought me the order. That's what suffering is in America. Suffering is now when we have to hear music we don't like. Or, or something happens we don't like. We're suffering. That's not suffering. Have they ever put your head down on a block and about to chop your head off? Have they ever killed one of your children for their belief? We don't know what suffering is, but we will as time marches on. Sin in the world today is what destroys people. I'll get us back here in a minute. We're on the tarmac. We're about to take off here in a second. It destroys people. Addictions destroy people. Those things destroy people. God hates sin because sin is what separates man from God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10. The Bible said, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. 
In other words, if you think you can drink, sleep around, do all the things you want to do, and still make heaven, you're listening to a hyper grace that is a bunch of wind blowing down the street. God still expects holiness out of us. He's coming back for a holy church. He's not coming back for a church that's holding on to the world and trying to hold on for him. Last time I read the book, the book said that there will be no sin in heaven. Not gonna happen. I know it's old fashioned. I know you're sitting here. I know you're sitting here and you don't wanna hear it. I know that because I sat there and I didn't wanna hear it. We don't want to hear about suffering. We don't want to hear about hard times. We don't want to hear about our problems. We want to talk about everybody else's and we want to talk about all his. I sat right there and I would hear the preacher preach about alcohol. I'd hear him preach about addiction. I'd hear him preach about lust. I'd hear him preach about all those things. And I'd think, man, who are you talking to? Because you're not talking to me. You're not talking to me. It separates us from God. The Bible said there is no darkness in him. And here, listen to verse 6. If we claim, listen to what verse 6 says. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. We cannot pick, listen church, I want to be your pastor for a second. You cannot pick and choose the parts you want to live and don't want to live. You cannot pick the parts that are easy and the parts that are hard and throw those out and keep the easy parts. You can't do that. It's the law. I didn't see a sign coming to church today that said speed limit 75, but for Britt Brooks, 99. Come on. I know you got a fancy car. I know you got on a big suit. I know you've been in this church for years, but the law doesn't just change because of you. I know, I know all those things, but it doesn't change because I don't, well, I don't feel like staying sober today. I need a cigarette to help my nerves. We'll come back next week. Or I better catch you now, because you're here now. You may not. I need a cigarette. It's got to calm my nerves. You know, this beer, it'll calm my nerves. Well, I know something that'll calm your nerves a whole lot better than any kind of Budweiser, Coors, or anything else. His name is Jesus Christ, and he said that at a mention of his name that every demon in hell has to scatter. When you say the name of Jesus, anxiety goes, depression goes. Why don't you give him a try? I said, why don't you give him a try today? Why don't you just say it right now? Jesus. I said, why don't you say it again? Jesus. If you can imagine when you say that name every demon in hell flees off the top of this hill because at a mention of his we need a mediator to intervene on our behalf we need a lawyer or a counselor to intervene on our behalf in John chapter 14 verse 26 the Bible said this in fact they're the words of Jesus he said all this I have spoken to you while I was with you but the advocate woo, the advocate the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said peace I leave with you my peace I give you not as the world gives don't let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid why because he left an advocate here in the Holy Ghost he left a lawyer here his name is Jesus I can call on his name what name are you calling this morning Marlboro marijuana sleeping pill Illicit sex. Come on, I know you don't like it. We gotta get rid of that demon too. You better start listening to some stuff today. R-rated movies. Come on, I'm talking to you. I know you're looking down. I know you can't look up here. I, I don't know. I sat there. When, when Larry Moore would get so anointed, 
he would get on the pew at Malvern First Assembly and he'd run up down those pews just preaching away and I thought that man's going to break his neck. He'd run up down, he'd just preach it and I'd sit right there thinking, you're not talking to me. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll do better when I get in college. Right. I'll do better when we get another pastor. Yeah. I'll do better when I get more money. Oh, I'll do better when. You fill in the blank. Preach. Well, I feel this. You listen to me, the when is never ever going to come. The devil will make sure that he stays on your property. He'll make sure that he takes up all your time. He'll make sure that he keeps you awake at night. He'll make sure that he sends plenty of friends along by your side to keep you out there on Lee Creek in the middle of the summer. He'll be sure that every time you turn around, there's dope being smoked. He'll make sure every time that what has always kept you will always keep you. If it's depression... He'll make sure that he keeps you. If it's grudges, unforgiveness, and bitterness, he knows it works. He will make sure that that keeps you. The only man that can take care of that for us is the advocate, Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Whew, it's hot up here. One of the most more dramatic but lesser known Scenes of American history took place on August 4th, 1735. In New York City, it occurred at the start of the trial of Peter Zinger. Peter Zinger was a German immigrant and local printer who dared to take a stand against a very corrupt New York governor, William Cosby. As Governor Cosby's acts became more outrageous and Zinger's newspaper spoke more harshly against those acts. The governor had Zinger thrown in jail. The governor's Supreme Court justice, whom he had chose, had the lawyers all disbarred who had stepped forward to defend Zinger. Although no charges were ever placed against Zinger, his bail was set at an enormous $1,000 in 1735. One, his bail was set. Unpayable, I don't know if that's a word, unpayable $1,000. The bail was set against Zinger. Two months later, Zinger still sat in jail, although the grand jury refused to indict him for anything at all. He still sits in jail. After nine months, Zinger went to trial for publishing false, scandalous information. His original attorneys had all been disbarred and lost their job. His current lawyer had been appointed by the governor and the jury had been instructed and selected by the governor to rule on whether Zinger did not publish or did publish the newspaper. His guilt as to the printed information in the paper had already been decided before court ever came into session. Zinger did not have a chance of acquittal. Then it happened on that day in the courtroom. From the back of the courtroom, a dignified, well-dressed man arose and walked forward to the front and stood in front of the justice. He announced that he would represent Zinger. The court immediately recognized the man as Andrew Hamilton, a respected member of the Pennsylvania Council and the Philadelphia Assembly at that time, and also the most celebrated lawyer whoo, in the city or in the new world at that time. Hamilton admitted that Zinger was the publisher, but pled for the right of men everywhere to be able to publish the truth, and Zinger was acquitted that day. Hey, this story reminds me of a scene of something else that happened in history. In fact, it's over 2,000 years ago. The scene took place. All the individuals throughout time on trial for their sin and the outcome of the case was certain. The sentence was death. However, this time the verdict was an outcome that they did not expect. The outcome of a 
crooked court was turned around. Every man stood justly accused of his sin. Then a man stepped forward on our behalf. He did not plead our innocence because we had none. He pled the right to take our place as guilty and have us pardoned. He pled the right to take our place. What an awesome picture of the love of God. He stepped forward on that day. He said they are guilty, but I'll take their place. He said I plead guilty for them to take. I will take their place. My God, if that doesn't make you excited, you ought to slap somebody and say he took your place. I said he took your place while you were still a sinner, while you were having sex, an adulterated he died for you, while you were drunk this past week, he died, he stood up, he said, I will take their place. You better be glad that the man of Jesus Christ stood up and on that day he put the crooked court to shame. He put the lawyer under his feet. And sh- Boy, I can't do no more than that. If you're Pentecostal, I don't know why. You're not clapping. I'm talking to you about Jesus. It was not Donald Trump. It wasn't Rudy Giuliani. It wasn't a national a lawyer from where Jesus stood up. Some of you are too prideful right now to even recognize. I know I'm loud. I, I understand. The Baptists don't shout like this. So y'all, they don't. On that day, while you were still so prideful, living it up, having sex on your wife, having sex on your husband. You ought to be locked up for years. Steal on your taxes. And can't forgive somebody. Full of pride, full of unforgiveness, full of bitterness, full of anger. Division, despite. Grudges, slander. You're guilty as charged. I was guilty as charged. Let's talk about me. Maybe that'll excite you. I was raised in church, backslid, and there is not anything I have not done. And if you don't like that, I'm not sure you understand grace and mercy. I'm not glorifying what I did by no means. I'm just telling you, you better get over yourself because everybody sitting in this room has got something in the closet. I just so happen to tell you about mine. I backslid out of church. I knew what it was. I was just there this weekend. Pastor Colby went with me on Friday. I drove him to Malvern. We were going. We took a long detour. I wanted to go around showing where I come from. Not that he cares, but we were just wasting time. And I drove him by there. I said, this is the church. This is the first. This is the first assembly of God church ever right here. And I got to attend it. I got four generations of people that went through this church. I said, I was raised in this church, and I backslid out of this church. I showed him. I said, every time right there's the high school gym, I said, every time I was driving to town, I got to the high school gym, I'd look to the left where I didn't have to look at that church. I was so convicted I could be stoned out of my ever-loving mind and knew that I was going past that church, and I thought, I ain't even looking at that place. It was conviction all over me. Some of you do the very same thing. Just when your mama woke you up today and told you it's coming to church, man, you didn't want to come to church. It's not because you don't want to be in church. It's because there's the things that the church will deal with on the inside of you. Ooh, I backslid out of church and without telling a long story, I was an alcoholic. We drank every day, all day. I smoked, I drank, I dipped. Most mornings I'd get up, brush my teeth before I ever got dressed and have a dip in my mouth. That's how, that's how stupid, that's how stupid the enemy will have you looking, walking around with dirt falling out of your mouth and smelling like you've already been to hell and back. 
Come on, somebody. He'll have you walking around. I'd been drinking for six years every single day. My mama invited me to go to church that day. I thought I'll go just to shut her up and keep her off of me. I walked into church that day. I sat about six rows back. I was so, we'd been out drinking for four days. I was drunk out of my ever-loving mind. I'm not telling you to glorify sin. I'm telling you it's my testimony. And you religious people can get over it because there's folks listening that need to hear it. And I sat there and the preacher got up he made a call I got up and went down to that altar I was drunk that day but I left a different man I've been different ever since I said Jesus stood up that day in that court he said today is the day I will take his place today Satan your turn's over and look at me now. I said, look at me now. They said, you'll never make it. They said, you'll never amount to nothing. Well, look at me now, honey. I'm the pastor of the greatest church in the state of Arkansas. I'm the pastor. I have a wonderful family, a beautiful wife. I said, if I had none of those things and I have Jesus, I've made it. You better quit thinking about all the things you don't have and you better celebrate God for the things you do have. You may not have a Mercedes, honey, but your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You may not be wealthy, but you're wealthy by heaven's means. I know some have gotta go because now they know their pastor was an addict. Well, let's just talk about what you're addicted to. You addicted to unforgiveness, pride, depression. Mine just happened to show up in a different form. My God, when, as, as the church, we're going to get over a bunch of this mess and get on to the fact that there's real life wearing people out. We get upset by this and we get upset by that. Well, all along you've been sitting here. Their sex trafficking people have driven right by this church. And you can't get, to, you can't get a blessing because you're too hung up on what we've done this morning. Or not done. Just met with a guy this past week. Last year, 700,000 kids in America were sex trafficked. 700,000 last year. You know where a lot of them came from? Right around here. Right around here. And we have sat back as the church I remember a time when somebody like me wouldn't have been welcomed in our church in Malvern. I remember a time there I wouldn't have been welcomed. If I'd have come in and it smelled me. I owned a convenience store in a town of 10,000 in a dry county. I sold everything in my store possible. And the church folks was coming buying from me. And you won't let me come in your church? Who, after I got saved? You know, the day because some of them there that day was at the same party I'd been at for four days. Y'all ain't. I'm sitting here in my pew drunk as I can be and they had a service about like this. The pastor, he preaching. I got up and walked down. I gave my life to the Lord. 
it's been different ever since, but when I turned around, who there were some folks getting them walking out. Boy, I'd like this. I better go back up here. Romans chapter 5. How did it get to be 11.30 this fast? Y'all bored? It's okay to say if you are. I, I get bored with my stuff every once in a while too. The church in America today, and I know we in this area, because we live in the Bible Belt, and still folks still believe in having lunch with their families and sitting down at a table, and we still believe that you ought to go to church. But it is rapidly declining. Rapidly going away. And if you think our elected officials are up there on your behalf, you're dead wrong. They don't want you doing what we're doing today. They don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear about the church. They don't want to hear about it. I stood there. With those kids this weekend watching them. And I thought, God, help them. God, make sure they know that they know that they know they're called to this. Make sure they know what they're called to. One of them is my own. What have we had on our minds when we put people out and we don't share the gospel that was so freely given to us what have we had on our mind? Romans chapter 5. Man, I'll have to come back and do this tonight, I guess. Maybe I'll save it for next week. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. The Bible said, See, at just the right time when we were still powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7 says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. Verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. At the bottom of the page I wrote this morning before I walked out here. And I wrote at the bottom of the page there, you were never meant to carry what you've been carrying beyond the cross. You were never meant to carry what you've been carrying beyond the cross. But the enemy's lied to you. And you bought it. And it's time we admit it. I was never meant to carry depression beyond the day of my salvation. I was never meant to carry unforgiveness. I was never meant to carry a, an addiction. I was never meant to carry that beyond the cross. And some of you have been carrying it for years. Your parents have been long in the grave and gone. And you're still carrying it. The person's dead, in jail, gone. You're married, moved on. You're still carrying it. It happened when you're six years old. You're still carrying it. You were never meant to carry it beyond the cross. But we carry it each week into the church. We carry it to the pastor. We carry it to our spouse. We carry it to our children. We carry it to our community. We even come to the altar and carry it to God. But keep walking off with it every time. 
and it's everybody's fault but the one that trespassed in the beginning. He didn't do this. I'm going to another church. They don't do that. I'm going to another church. They didn't do this. I'm finding me another wife. She didn't do this. I'm going to find me another husband. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. Well, all along, they never had anything to do with it in the beginning. You're just carrying something that you were never meant to carry. And you forced the blame on somebody else. I know it's heavy. It's heavy. This is heavy. And I got more. I'll try to catch it up tonight. We'll see what happens. Is he still a trespasser just because he's been there for a long time? I mean, he's been there for years. Surely the rule of something's run out here. He's been there a long time. You know what they call that nowadays? A squatter. After they've been there long enough and they just took up residence, there's no reason now to deal with them at all. They've been here a long time. They're squatters. We got used to pornography living there. Squatting on our property. We got used to pride, bitterness, unforgiveness. Hate. Hate. They've been squatting. Boy, I'd like to preach that a while. What do you do? Come find out next week. Come here, Brother Chad. Yesterday on our way back from Hot Springs, I came back early to get ready for tonight and I'll just have you know that your pastor is saved. I rededicated my life three different times because Kobe was driving through those mountains in Hot Springs. Ooh, I told him at one point, I said, pull over because I'm fixing to revoke your license right here in the middle of this highway. I was trying to, I was trying to finish this sermon in that van and I, I had to wrap it up. Sorry, <laughs> I had to put it up. I rededicated my life several times in that van. All the way back, not all the way, but as we entered somewhere right outside of Hot Springs on Highway 7, if you've ever made that drive, it's a beautiful drive, beautiful drive. And, and we got outside of Hot Springs somewhere, and, and we literally, I, I believe this was the Lord answered my prayer, because, and this is not exaggeration, he was there. There was a, the speed limit's 55 and 60 through there in places, and we were going 10, this lady pulled out in front of us. I don't know what planet she was on. She wasn't on ours, but I just think God answered my prayer for her pulling out in front of me. <laughs> I started once to jump out and run up there and tell her, hey, let's speed up a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> it slowed me down, slowed us down long enough for me to look out the window and notice something. All the way through those mountains coming back, I got to noticing purple marking paint on those trees there were not very many no trespassing signs but as we were following the lady going 10 I noticed long way through those mountains there was places that were marked with that purple paint and I looked at Pastor Kobe and I said Kobe I said do you know what that means he said and he preached the sermon back to me I said somebody was listening you got it but here's what I noticed from the highway and then once we were back up to speed and I'm still looking out the window from some distances away I can still see that paint even at speed that we're supposed to be going I can still see that paint because that person took the time to properly 
mark their property. So if Pastor Kobe and I wanted to pull over and go sightseeing, I said to him, we can't because that paint is just like a fence or a barbed wire fence. We can't go out there if we want to. Why? Because the property has been properly marked. And so me being, therefore then, an enemy on that property, if I've gone past the paint, I'm now a trespasser and I'm in trouble. Why? Because the people took the time to properly mark the property. Some of you sitting in this room, you've marked it. But here's what you've done. That's what you've done. You've got just enough to be able to run up in the group that's cussing and drinking and say, look at me. You got just enough that you can come this morning and pay your tithes and think you're okay because you got just enough. Can the furthest person, Dad, can you see, can you see that paint on his shirt? You can't? Why? Sorry? Say it again. Say it one more time. Okay. Well, well, let's just now take care of that. Just the shirt. Yeah. Now, that, can you see that marked on that right there? Can the furthest one see that marked on that right there? Because now he's been properly marked. And now that an enemy that wants to come by to steal, kill, and destroy can see from a long distance away that he has properly marked that property and the enemy can say, I better not go there because he's got the law. The law will be on his side. I can't go past that because he's properly marked his property. Some of you today just have a little. Let me tell you, a little is not enough. The devil took your health. The devil's got you addicted. The devil has you living in fear because you've not properly marked your property. I wouldn't leave this house today until I could certainly show the devil, look, I've marked my property. I've marked my family. I've marked my life. No trespassing. No, I'm putting up a new sign. I said, I'm putting up a new sign in my life. You can't do it because you're carrying too much around. You can't stop to paint the sign because you're carrying too much. You can't stop because you're carrying around too much. This is your answer. I'm not mad. I love you. And I'm trying to tell you the truth. And some of you are going to walk right out of this building. You're going to walk right out of this building and you're going to have the pastor for lunch. But he ain't there. You can't mark your property because you're carrying too much. You were never meant to carry. And the devil has squatted in your home and you've made friends with him. He's been here so long, let's just leave him alone. There ain't no sense in going out marking my property. They show up all the time. Boy, I'm telling you the truth. I, I don't know if you appreciate it or not, but it's the truth. I'm not trying to get applause. I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I just want to know that somebody heard what God said this morning and you're ready to make a difference. If not, listen to what this preacher's telling you. You walk right out of here. Walk out of here with unforgiveness. Walk out of here with a grudge. Walk out of here with it. Walk out of here with it. And you know what's going to happen? It may, it will continue to affect you, but guess who it's going to affect the most? Your family and those around you. Because you're carrying something you were never meant to carry all along. 
Some of you are sitting here, standing here, whatever. You're here, you're, you're listening. And I can come get you. But you got just enough. Just enough. And we don't want to go too far. Pastor, you ruined his shirt. That's all right, because we talked about this beforehand. I'll buy him another shirt. Two or three. Some of you got just enough. Because, Pastor, we don't want to overdo it here. You know, they're going to make fun of me. They're going to make fun of you anyway. Listen, you, you can... You can try to walk in the will of God, grow a church, reach people, get folks saved, get folks filled for the Holy Ghost, reach the community, try to do something for the young people. You can do something with a clean heart and a pure heart, and they're going to talk about you anyway. They will smear you. I wish we could have a truth-telling service. In fact, let's just have one now. Where'd all the amens go? In fact, let's just talk, let's just talk about it. Some of their hearts just stopped. <laughs> They're going to talk about you anyway. You can be successful. They're going to talk. You can lose all you got. They're going to talk. You can have the best education. They're going to talk. You can be dumb as a box of rocks. They're going to talk. Oh, Pastor, we can't go that far because, you know, then everybody's going to know. I won't be invited to the party. I, I won't be invited. They're not going to ask me out. If, if I show too much here, you know, without going into a whole lot because you're standing, it's time to go. Jesus said, and I hope I don't do anything to the scripture, but here's what he said. He said, they're going to hate you because of me. If you show any kind of fruit at all because of me, they're going to hate you. Come tonight, and if I can, we'll see. I'll go pray, figure out which message the Lord wants for tonight. He said, they're going to hate you because of me. It's happening right in front of us. Things you never thought you'd see back in the 60s. You never thought you'd see in the church. You never saw it. It's happening right in front of you. And we've had the answer the entire time. It's no trespass. Lord, I felt you here today. I feel you here now. And God, I come against every trespasser in this building. I come against every enemy in this room right now that's at work to try to distract young people, trying to distract older people, trying to distract all your people right now. Come on, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're praying. Run the enemy off. I come against every hindrance. I come against every hindrance, Lord, in this room right now. Lord, the person that's sitting there living in a wrong kind of relationship, I come against the enemy that's talking to them right now. The person that's closet drinking, I come against that enemy that's telling them right now it's okay. I come against that enemy. Lord, you said truth, that truth would set us free. Let the truth arise today and the enemy be scattered. While your head bowed and your eyes closed, this is a moment of truth for you. And again, I know I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ignorant enough to think that, that this is going to catch everybody because it's not. Because you have squatters and squatters have been there for a long time. But here's two questions for you today while nobody's looking around. And if this is you, I'm, I just want you to step out from where you are. You say, Pastor, I'm carrying something. I'm tired of carrying it. I want it gone today. I'm going to deliver it to God. If that's you, I want you to come to this altar right now. Don't wait one second. Come on, you're carrying something you were never meant to carry beyond the cross. And you've been carrying it. Come on, this moment's for you. Boy, there's a whole lot more people ought, ought to be coming if it's for a few, if it's just for a couple, hey, that's, that's perfectly fine with me. I've been carrying something, Pastor. It's got heavy. I'm tired of carrying it. You were never meant to carry. You were never meant to carry cancer. You were never meant to carry depression. You were never meant to carry unforgiveness, pride, bitterness, anger. You were never meant to carry any of that. Pastor, I'm carrying it today. Here's the second one. 
You'd say, Pastor, today I, I just got a little bit of it. I'm the first one. I just got a little bit of it today. And I'm going to put, I'm going to apply it all to my life today. I want everything God has for me. If that's you, I want you to come right now. Come on, I'm going to make it easier for you. I want you to stand. If that's you today, Pastor, I'm going to, I'm marking my property today. There's a lady in this church and I don't have her permission. But I'll tell you what she told me. This week, she said, Pastor, after that sermon, no trespasses, she said, it changed my life. She said, that Sunday afternoon, I went home, got me a bottle of oil. She said, I went to all four corners of my property. She said, my family was sitting in the house watching TV. She said, I dipped my finger in that oil and I went to every family member. They said, what are you doing? She said, I'm marking my property today for God. Come on, if you're here and you'll come to this altar and you'll just say, I'm gonna, I'm marking my property today. I'm unashamed and I'm gonna mark my property today. If that's you, make your way this way today. That ought to be every person in this building that can physically make it this way. I'm going to show the trespasser. I'm going to show the devil that I've got my property marked. I'm not ashamed of God. I'm not ashamed of the cross. I'm not ashamed to be a follower.